I can interpret it any way I want. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dan. Into the mute. Sorry. Uh, so uh, that that did clear everything up. Sorry about that. Uh, I needed to to cycle. Um, I had resources getting contested and uh, fun stuff like that. All right. So, uh, since I haven't had time to bug folks, did everyone uh, already sign up for uh, Scribe? No. So, uh, if I could get a couple of Scribes, we have a, 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 a we're going to kick off our uh, use case uh, exploration again, and uh, we have a special guest today. Dr. Roy has joined us. And I'm Roy is uh, uh, here to uh, continue some of the discussion that uh, um, Mark shared with us. And uh, um, as soon as we get uh, two scribes describing, we can uh, get started. I can be one of them. That's Mark. Great, thank you, Mark. Okay, I need one more. Anyone else wanna join uh, Mark in, uh, in capture notes today? All right, well, in the sake of time, I'm gonna put my name down and join Mark and uh, allow us to get uh, get started. Um, all right, so um, before we uh, you know, dive into the, the use case with uh, Dr. Roy, uh, I'd like to uh, you know, give the opportunity to um, to have check-ins from any of the SIGs and, and uh, working groups. Um, anything in uh, SIG auth or uh, the policy working group that uh, anyone has to share? Okay. So, Mark, maybe you uh, could uh, introduce Dr. Roy and uh, you know, connect the dots from uh, the, you know, the the discussion that you uh, shared with us and and uh, what we have today. Sure, I'd be glad to do that. Awesome, thank you. The NISC Big Data Working Group has been cranking along since this uh, summer of 2013. This is uh, not a standards body per se. The output is three technical reports of which we've produced one. Another one is in review at NIST. It'll probably come out in the next uh, five or six weeks, maybe before that. Uh, we haven't got around to publishing our papers, but we're working on that, aren't we, Arnab? Uh, Arnab and I uh, co-chair the security and privacy subgroup of that big data working group. And uh, in that role, Arnab is the primary guy that covers all the crypto aspects of that. So while we've worked on the uh, the models together and uh, basically hammered out the drafts t together and helped adjudicate the content we got from other third parties, um, he's really the primary contributor to our backgrounding uh, on blockchain, uh, crypto aspects of um, data at rest, and what the role of some of those things might be and some of the emerging big data technologies. So. He's really the better of the two of us to present those aspects of it. Um, he also had some experience previously in the cloud security group. Uh, uh, maybe you'll want to mention that, Arnab, when you, when you kick that off. 
Over to you, buddy. Thanks, Mark. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I really got scared when you said the use cases because what I'm going to talk about is not as much a use case, but an overview of the document that we are going to talk about. Is that okay? That's great. Uh, you know, for us, uh, we're considering you know, the ingest that we're doing uh, and, and uh, gaining understanding of uh, you know uh, what's going on in the ecosystems uh, broadly characterizes use cases. Um, but yeah, that's fine. Right. So, but before I dive in, uh, this is my first time to this uh, meeting, and uh, thanks for inviting me, by the way. Uh, but can you give me a very short overview of what this working group does so that maybe I can tailor my presentation better? You bet. Uh, I'll, I'll give you our you know, elevator pitch. So, uh, you know, the, the SAFE working group uh, exists, uh, you know, uh, in the, the, the cloud native space. Uh, we are a proposed working group for the, uh, the CNCF. Um, there are very few of those. Uh, so there's you know, infrastructure and CI uh, and you know, a couple other serverless. Um, you know, the, the, in the actual uh, CNCF and the you know, cloud native uh, you know, overarching ecosystem, there are very few uh, of these working groups. Uh, if you go down like into Kubernetes, there you know is a uh, extensive ecosystem of SIGs and special interest groups and, and working groups. Um, that are operating there, and you know what we're focused on in the safe working group is uh, you know safety in you know this this cloud ecosystem where you have the operator, the administrator, uh, you know the developer, the end user, uh, and you know, we're we're trying to uh, you know build understanding uh, and and shared vocabulary around uh, how we we um, you know. Uh, make sure that there's you know, secure access and you know, operational safety uh, in place that all of those uh, parties in this uh, uh, new cloud ecosystem, um, that, that, that everyone has a clear sense of what's going on there. I see. Thanks, Dan, for that overview. And it seems like I'll be preaching to the choir. So, you know, much, <laughs> of, what I, <laughs> much of what I would say might seem, you know, juvenile to you. And, uh, uh, and, you know, as as uh, as you talked about your group, it seems like uh, many of the metaphors that we use in the big data working group might just carry over to your group, and we would like like to hear uh, maybe now, maybe later. Uh, you know how these things are that we we talk about in our documents are relevant to you guys. So. Uh, I would like to share a presentation on the screen. Uh, let me try to see if I can. There's that. a big uh, green button that says uh, share screen at the bottom. Share screen, okay. Uh, okay, can you see this? Looks good. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is the security and privacy of big data. Uh, it's the NIST perspective. Uh, that is the perspective of the documents that we produced in our working group. Uh, and uh, Mark has contributed a lot to this document. So we start off with, we started off this working group with a lot of discussion on what is big data. So this was back in 2013. And you know there were very diverse opinions on what constitutes big data. I'm sure the answer is not canonicalized even now. But this is the definition we came up with in our document. It may not be perfect, but it was a consensus. So it goes like big data consists of extensive data sets in the characteristics of volume, variety, velocity, and or variability that require a scalable architecture for efficient storage, manipulation, and analysis. And this definition is there in part one of our documents. 
So, of course, security and privacy are important for big data. You all know that, so I don't have to go through this slide. Uh, essentially, it says that it's very important because it causes damage to company reputation when it breaches our trust, and that can be evaluated in dollars. So, the big data working group started out with five subgroups, uh, definitions and taxonomies, use, uh, use cases and requirements, security and privacy, reference architecture, standards roadmap. Uh, the, the subgroups have kind of um, spread out from 2013 to now, so we may have more deliverables than subgroups. At this point, the definitions are a bit uh, nebulous. But the deliverables are what you see on the right, uh, one through seven. And number four is the big data security and privacy document, which I'm going to talk about. So we released our version one three years ago. Uh, and the NIST SP1500-4 is our document. And uh, it's available on this site that I gave a long link to in the slide. Uh, version 2 draft, uh, as Mark said, is it's in NIST review phase. Uh, public comments were received in September 21st. And uh, the public comments version is also available on the web. So given that background, uh, I'll go into some of the characteristics that we identify in the document that are seemingly different for big data compared to what was before. So we spent a lot of time understanding, you know, what is emergent about the security and privacy of big data given its principal characteristics. So it seemed that there were two aspects. One is due to scaling, and this you can attribute to the volume and velocity characteristics of big data. And it has to do with uh, many things. I, I'll, I'll cover those in the next slide. Uh, the other more foundational aspect is mixing. Uh, and this is the notion that uh, one of the characteristics, of, a very important characteristic of big data is that you get data from diverse endpoints and a huge amount of data. And some of that data may not be completely accurate as well. So you get this mixing characteristics, which can be attributed loosely to the variety and veracity characteristics of uh, big data. And that causes emergent problems for security and privacy. So to go into some amount of detail, so on the left is what are different due to scaling, on the right, what are different due to mixing. So the scaling can be Scaling problem can be summarized as, you know, how do you retarget your existing systems due to the infrastructural shift because of big data? So the infrastructural shift is due to various things like distributed computing platforms like Hadoop, uh, non-relational data stores, et cetera. So paradigm shift in infrastructural thinking has uh, required is still requiring uh, new solutions in security and privacy. The other is a more foundational aspect, the mixing aspect. And here the problem is to control the visibility of data while enabling utility. So what is this about? So here the principal questions are, you know, how do you balance privacy and utility? So you get a lot of data. Uh, but, and to be useful, all that data needs to be used, uh, but then you also run into these privacy aspects where you combine different sorts of data about different individuals and you get a bigger picture that may not be quite apparent from individual data sets alone. Uh, how do you enable analytics and governance on encrypted data? And then finally, how do you reconcile authentication and anonymity, which uh, on the face of it seem, seem to be at conflict. So uh, these aspects are all described in section two of our document. Uh, we then go into 
some amount of depth regarding how do you characterize different uh, uh, different security and privacy aspects that arise due to these principal aspects of big data. So there were five V words that were identified. Uh, volume, velocity, variety, veracity, volatility. And uh, what I give in this, sli this slide and the next one are examples of security and privacy concerns that arise due to, especially due to each of these characteristics. So for example, uh, the variety characteristic of big data uh, is, uh, is uh, is apparent where you know traditional encryption schemes, which render uh, data into uh, into a random collection of bits, that hinders organization of data based on semantics. Uh, then volume of big data uh, requires that you store them in multi-tier data storages. So that is a lot of back and forth of data between different storages. And all of this communication requires threat models to identify, you know, is the communication secure or not? Is the data being handled properly or not? So these are complex and evolving mm -hmm. issues. Uh, and then the velocity aspect is that, uh, is the retargeting that I, talked about, so data is coming at a very fast pace. Uh, how do you retarget traditional security mechanisms to support this? So veracity has to do with uh, provenance as uh, uh, Mark talked about last time. So this is keeping track and ensuring integrity of the ownership, source, and other metadata of individual data. Uh, and how do you take care of that given the complex movement of data between nodes, entities, and geographical boundaries. Uh, volatility of data is another big aspect. So indefinitely persistent data requires evolving S&P considerations because the ownership may change, mergers and acquisitions, and so on. Like who takes ownership and responsibility of keeping the data safe? Um, so this is, these were characteristics of big data enforcing new requirements in security and privacy. Uh, we then, in section four, uh, try to classify security and privacy topics. We have two kinds of classifications. One is uh, cross-domain and cross-infrastructure, and trying to look at the type of property that each SNP requirement is. So some properties are privacy properties. You want to keep data secret or safe, confidential. Uh, provenance properties, you want to keep the data accurate. Uh, you want to identify who owns the data and so on. System health has to do with, uh, are there security vulnerabilities in the infrastructure itself? Can somebody exploit that? How do you keep the health of the system safe? And then some of these have to do with public policy aspects. So these are things like, you know, what is right and what is wrong to do with data uh, from a policy point of view. And then there are operational classifications of SNP topics. So this has to do with the particular infrastructure that we have in place today. So there are devices, uh, their identities, and you have to manage access to them. Uh, you have to govern the use and access of data. Uh, you have to manage infrastructure, and also you have to, uh, you know, risk analyze and account for each of these aspects. Uh, are there any questions so far? Sorry, I, I just went on. Um, no, this this is really good. Thanks, Dan. Okay. okay, so so we covered uh, how the characteristics of big data uh, define new emergent SNP considerations, and we classified SNP concerns for different types of systems. Uh, a centerpiece of our working group is a 
is a reference architecture. And that becomes especially important for security and privacy. Uh, the reason is security and privacy does not compose. What do I mean? So let's say we have two systems, system A and system B, and we have completely analyzed them. So we have, uh, we have seen what the endpoints of system A are, what the endpoints of system B are. Uh, they have data inflows and outflows. Uh, we have complete accountability for each of them, and we have, let's say, we have guaranteed that you know it, they they satisfy some security requirements, right? But uh, when we put system A and system B together, then suddenly it may turn out that security properties are no longer satisfied, and that's because there may be. Uh, APIs in system B which leak data from system A. So they may, together, they may have unknown data flow uh, patterns that were not analyzed when they were in isolation. So combined systems can have unexpected data flows. They can destructively interfere. So it's very important. The point of this is it's very important to think of SNP from an architectural standpoint. Like think of the system as a whole rather than modular in parts. It's also important to look at each module individually, but then when combining, we have to ensure additional properties. So there is a need for architectural thinking, and that's where it becomes important that we refer to this NIST big data reference architecture. So Mark might have already talked about this, but uh, this is also described in uh, one of the documents in our working group, I think it's number six. Uh, and, it, and it conceptualizes big data systems as these boxes. Uh, we have data providers and data consumers. Uh, there, there is an application provider which sits in the middle of that, and it provides different collection and access, access uh, capabilities. Uh, the framework provider is the underlying infrastructure, which, which uh, gives processing and platforms and infrastructures. And there is a system orche orchestrator at the top who is uh, orchestrating all this movement. Uh, and you can see that there is a security and privacy fabric all around the system. So what does that mean meant to signify? It signifies that uh, this fabric is all around the system, and you cannot think of it in isolation. So we have to think of security and privacy at each of the interfaces between the boxes, as well as internally to the boxes. So that's what we at least preliminarily did uh, in the version of one of our document in section five of the document, you can find some of the security aspects uh, that we talked about. Like for example, in the interface between data provider and application provider, you have to do endpoint input validation. On the other end, from going from big data application provider to data consumer, there's concerns about privacy preserving data analytics and dissemination. Uh, in the framework provider, you have need for key management, securing data storage, and transaction logs, and so on. And in section three of our document, we also talk about a bunch of use uh, cases. Uh, Dr. Uh, I have a question on uh, architecture before you move on to the next section. Uh, yeah, sure. So it's, it's a bit of a meta question, my apologies. Um, so when, when, when you were saying, uh, reference architecture, um, did you, uh, did, did, you know, the group there, uh, go and actual, uh, actually, you know, build this out or, you know, just, uh, you know, laid out sort of the architectural definition of, uh, what a typical system, uh, is, is it looks like. So a combination of both. So mm -hmm. this, this was a lot of discussions actually. It mm -hmm. consumed uh, a year and a half, I would say. Uh, so we started with a lot of existing architectures. Mm -hmm. Like there was an architecture from IBM, there was an architecture from other places. Uh, we actually have a document in our working group that goes through each of these proprietary mm -hmm. or public architectures. 
Yes. And then the group sifted through those architectures, saw what were the principal characteristics that we were looking for, and this is the architecture that evolved out of all those dis- discussions. So it mm. took a lot of time to evolve. Right. Yeah, it had been evolving even till like last year. So yeah. I don't think in a uh, we have have changed it in a in in the last year, but that that's what the amount of uh, evolution that it went through. Got it. And, and so, what what did you end up doing in terms of the you know the the technical code part uh, of this? You know, what what? I'm sorry, I did. Uh, I did not get your question. Sorry. Uh, so the, you know, the 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 code component. Um, what 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 purpose does that end up serving for uh, your group? The reference architecture itself. So we right. try to describe everything with respect to the reference architecture, even in the security and privacy document. Mm -hmm. So we try to identify how each of our concepts, each of our classifications, each of the technologies that we identify, how do they fit into the reference architecture? So that's why it it constitutes uh, uh, a linkage piece, an arbitration point, where which defines how we go through the document. Great. The reason why I'm asking is, uh, you know, this is an area where, uh, you know, we uh, sort of kind of backed away from, uh, you know, going down this path just because, uh, you know, taking and, um, you know, coalescing all those things uh, across the, the cloud ecosystem, uh, you know, seemed uh, daunting and, um, you know, possibly impractical. Um, so, I mean, good, good context that, you know, yeah, it, it does take an incredible amount of time to go and, you know, uh, capture and distill that down. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I understand uh, your point. Uh, so, Cloud Security Alliance had this huge reference architecture with like 300 boxes, mm, mm. right? Well, so, but what we opted for, uh, well, the, uh, one of the reasons is big data systems are so diverse. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm it's not as homogenous an entity as a cloud. Right. So when we describe big data systems, you know, big data systems are everywhere. You have healthcare, you have uh, fundamental physics, you have aviation, you have transportation, Mm -hmm. you have so many use cases and each of those use cases uh, can identify at least something that, you know, may not fit readily into this architecture, Mm -hmm. but uh, it, it is actually one of the reasons why uh, our reference architecture is so succinct instead of going into, mm-hmm. uh, you know, 300 little pieces of detail. Right, right. Uh, Makes sense. Because it has to homogenize mm-hmm. an inherently inhomogeneous collection of use cases. Right. Great. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so we collected all these use cases. Uh, Many of these are actually from Mark, uh, and he might have talked about some of these. Uh, But uh, overall, uh, there were there were like five big buckets: retail marketing, healthcare, cybersecurity, government, and industrial big data. So, with that, I would like to dive into uh, some of the cryptographic aspects that we talked about in this uh, document. So these are emerging cryptographic technologies and uh, the recommendation from uh, this document is to be aware of these technologies and to be aware of risk benefit uh, analysis of uh, choosing some of these technologies over others. so this table is divided into uh, various facets. So I talk about specific uh, cryptographic technologies on the left. Uh, these are emergent. Uh, some of these are in limited deployment, but most of it is in uh, is in research stage. Uh, and all of these technologies provide different kinds of features while 
uh, affording visibility to controlled entities. So what do I mean by that? Uh, the first example is how do you outsource computation securely? So an example is suppose you want to send all your sensitive data to the cloud, photos, medical records, and so on. Uh, you can send everything encrypted, but the cloud can't help you much after that. So you can't find out, for example, how much you spent on movies last month if everything you sent to the cloud was encrypted mm -hmm. with your own. So fully homomorphic encryption is a crypto technology which enables you to do just that. So you encrypt uh, your data and then the cloud can do analogous computation called uh, homomorphic computation, which is, uh, which is a transformation of the actual computation. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the amazing thing about this is that it only operates on ciphertext. Uh, it never has to decrypt the data. So all ciphertext, all process ciphertext are all random sequence of bits to the cloud. Uh, and then the cloud can send you your processed encrypted data and only you can decrypt it. So this is uh, great because you know the only can only the, the user can decrypt the process data and there is an end-to-end -end security. So you you get to pick your key and so on. Uh, we can also control visibility, like who we gi give access to, based on encryption technology. So this is traditionally done by uh, role-based access control or some other types of access control by systems like operating systems and virtual machines. So these usually restrict access to data, but the data is still in plain text. Mm -hmm. uh, if, so, so in particular, if you hack the system, you get access to the data. And when you want to send the data in transit, then the security is kind of ad hoc, depends on system to system. Uh, so now the question we ask is, can we encrypt it in such a way that we do not have to go through all this? So decryption is only possible by entities allowed by the policy. Uh, so this is kind of you know technologically enforced rather than system enforced. Uh, well, of course you can hack keys, but this is a much smaller attack surface. So a key, a key can be a few kilobytes and you can have very special protective mechanisms to protect small keys rather than you know gigabytes of data. Uh, and then encrypted data can be moved around as well as kept at rest. The handling is uniform. So, so many of you might already know examples of this. So the, the starting point is public key encryption. So uh, how public key encryption works is that there is a certificate authority. It signs certificates of public key and then you, know, you can show let's say Alice and Bob are trying to communicate, then Bob can show his signed certificate of public key, then Alice can use that public key to encrypt data, and only Bob can decrypt it. So this is just a plain public key encryption. Uh, going one level higher, uh, there's something called identity-based encryption. So here the idea is that there is no signed certificate of uh, public key. Uh, you can just use the identity of some person and there is a master public key, just one master public key, and you just use that master public key and the identity of the person you want to encrypt to, and that's all you need to encrypt your data. Any other person cannot, with the, even using the same master public key, cannot decrypt your data. So in this scenario, Alice can use the master public key and just the identities, like maybe email address of Bob or George to encrypt the data. And only Bob or George can decrypt their respective ciphertext. So taking this to the extreme, we have policy-based encryption. So here the policy can be a complex predicate, so which is indicated as pi here. So 
this is one simple scenario where there is a uh, there is a hospital and let's say uh, somebody can see a patient's data only if he or she is a doctor or a nurse who also works in the ICU so it this is a more complex policy predicate than just identification uh, so what policy based encryption does is uh, is enables an encryptor to encrypt to a policy rather than some identity so you can encrypt to a policy of your choice which can be complex and then only people who satisfy that policy will be able to decrypt and nobody else uh finally we also talk about blockchain uh so we avoid the financial aspect of blockchain uh in this document uh so we we don't know how uh, how important that is uh but there are many technological aspects of blockchain which can be very useful in the security and privacy space especially things like asset and ownership management uh transaction logging for audit and transparency uh, bidding for auctions and contract management and so on uh so the high level recommendations are as follows so which technology to use among all these cryptographic technologies is it involves a lot of risk benefit analysis uh we have to consider sensitivity of the data cost of bridge and cost of securing securing systems when doing this analysis so i give an example where you know there are three different cost benefit analysis so let's say we want to run the task of uh uh running software on encrypted data at rest there are three possibilities so let's say we just do what is traditionally done which is decrypt the data in the cloud and run software so you your data is encrypted at rest uh but you can decrypt it and then just run plain software on it so what are the pros of that a uh, very very fast execution uh problem is if the server is hacked decryption key is leaked all the data is exposed uh the second better option is run the software on the decrypted data inside a hardware security module so there are many hardware security modules uh in the market today uh, prominent ones are like intel sps or trust arm zone so this is a little less fast than uh than just doing computation on plain data but it's still practical uh but there are some problems which have not been solved satisfactorily yet and these are to do with side channel attacks uh and these attacks are uh kind of uh you know you can you can see the patterns of uh memory addresses and so on and can infer something about something secret uh the final completely secure solution is you know you just use fully homomorphic encryption uh the pros there is it's cryptographically secure there are no side channel attacks secure against all the vulnerabilities of the last two solutions uh it works even if you completely breach the server but uh the disadvantage is that it's very slow at this point except for limited operations well, so just to conclude uh you know uh there are four things that i want to take you away uh think of security and privacy at the time of architecting the overall system and uh, not as an afterthought which is which is which is the way many systems are designed today unfortunately uh in security and privacy uh systems do not compose so you have to reanalyze security and privacy when you add new features or join new systems uh there's a lot of cryptography that is emergent uh you just have to stay tuned and patient at this point but uh, it will enable many remarkable operations in the future and finally 
uh, it's very important to read this document <laughs> for uh, uh, and we hope that uh, you have uh, feedback for us that's uh, useful. Um, we, we should be able to document that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Roy. So I'd like to open the, the floor to any uh, questions, uh, you know, a, a request, uh, you know, either to yourself, Dr. Roy or, or Mark. Um, it'd be fantastic if in the meeting notes we could link to you know, not only uh, Dr. Roy's presentation, uh, but if we could you know, provide links to uh, the documents, I believe, uh, you know, Mark, you, you touched on some of these in the uh, issues uh, in our GitHub repo. Um, but you know, for those that are uh, you know following along, uh, if we can point them to uh, a way to go d deeper in this, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I have a question about uh, a combination of data and, and the way that changes. Uh, uh, the access control, right? We, we see both that you can, uh, by combination, you can de-anonymize data. So data that was previously anonymized and that maybe doesn't need strong access control, suddenly by combining that, you you, you have the need for stronger access control. And also the, the, the reverse, where you have data that gets aggregated so the, the access control doesn't have to, have to be as secure, right? Um, was there any thought on that in, in your... Um, Right, so we touched on this uh, in the variety aspect uh, of big data requiring new thoughts on architecting secure systems. And you bring up a very good point where architectural thinking is very, very necessary, not only at the level of a single organization, but as a whole of you know what is going on uh, throughout the internet. Because uh, as you said, you can aggregate data from various endpoints and suddenly you have a much clearer picture of uh, of sensitive data than before. So uh, it's unclear uh, at this point, like how you can, so, you know, technologies like differential privacy, uh, they have a privacy budget, which is that uh, you always leak some amount of information, even if you aggregate and if you do that too many times, then the privacy budget is lost, which means that over time, you get clearer and clearer, more and more accurate picture of the sensitive data. So this is kind of inevitable. So uh, other than like completely restricting access to the data, it is not clear how to stop this leak of information. Where does anonymity, uh, so, you know, in order to, to guarantee some degree of privacy, you know, you, we, you know, tend to, to lean towards systems that, uh, you know, identify the, the, the players. Um, you mentioned anonymity at some point, uh, you know, how are you dealing with anonymity and trying to, to solve, uh, or, you know, are we trying to solve for anonymity? So uh, for the NIST, for our document, uh, we just uh, you know describe what the problem is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a solution document. But in the research community, uh, uh, there are technical aspects too. So I talked about you know how do you reconcile authentication and anonymity, right? So that is a technical question that the research community has been looking at. So. There's, there are primitives called group signatures, for example. What does group signature mean? It means that uh, you have a group of people uh, and anybody can sign a message, but you won't know who signed it. Mm -hmm. So you can still authenticate that person, mm -hmm. but you will not know beyond the group structure mm -hmm. who that person is or entity is. Uh, so you could say, you know, give them the same signing key, right? But that is not desirable because later on there might be an arbitration process where, where you want some amount of non-repudiation. You want to hold that person responsible 
if uh, a legal case comes up for example right so so that's why this this kind of uh, primitive is is far more sophisticated than just giving out the same signature keys to everybody so this system in fact allocates a trusted arbiter hmm. who has some more information so that he can look at the signature and identify who signed it but without going through this arbiter nobody can find out who signed hmm. so that is one of the technologies that addresses uh, reconciling authentication and anonymity and you can think of it as uh, in an iot context as well like there are different iot devices you don't want to specifically pinpoint which device it came from maybe that's very personal right. but if there is a glass breaking scenario you want to know mm-hmm. yeah the, the concept of uh, you know trusted arbiter I, i think will uh, uh, come in handy you know as as we model things out yeah mm-hmm. yeah one of the approaches that uh that came up and as Arnav said, we don't really get very prescriptive, but we talk about trying to te- treat PII and what PII is uh, varies depending on the domain. You know, it could be a floating point number depending on the scenario, right? Uh, but if you have a domain that you can consult to understand the meaning of a thing, you might want to tag that data throughout a system. And that includes when you federate the data. So the, the persistence of Some people call this metadata, but really it's you know just carrying other data along with it in some kind of structured uh, framework so that you can uh, do traceability and provenance so you can understand when it's been violated. So that's kind of the fundamental principle in doing PCI compliance or being HIPAA compliant, which is you know something most of the big companies we're in have to do on a regular basis. But the, the problem is there for everybody really, because uh, if you think of PII is just an instance of really, really important data in some domain, then that's, a, that's an issue we all face at some level. So from a security point of view, you want to know that those, that you can expose uh, where that data has been used if you need to and who's touched it and to authenticate the people who've done the touching. And that includes machines. And that's why, uh, I don't know if you were there, Dan, when you were trying to get booted up. Um, I was touching on this issue of authenticating these low-cost smart home devices. No. Uh, no. It, it's a, an interesting use case, and stop me if I already mentioned it to this group, but uh, anybody on this call have them at home already? I've got an Alexa. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have any, like smart, uh, smart switches tied to it? Yeah. So the smart switches – are mostly uh, going to cloud services overseas, mm-hmm. <laughs> written by who knows who, in fact. Mm-hmm. In fact, the error messages that come back are, are in Chinese. You see, you see the Chinese stuff at the top and then, so this is an interesting problem. We have a cloud service from Amazon doing the driving, a local IoT device, i.e. Alexa, on your home network, probably on a single segment, uh, collecting data for Amazon, uh, but, going out to these other cloud services to direct traffic out to these devices. And if you like blow this into a neighborhood or utility scenario, it's an interesting problem, which kind of is part of the rationale why we uh, were, were glad in retrospect that we stayed away from the more expansive cloud specific model, because this is more realistic. I think this multiple, multiple cloud, multiple entity, multiple, uh, developer communities even. Right. So it's more of a, I guess, a case study than a use case, but it, it certainly is a realistic one, at least in my house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And you can drop, you know, drop a, uh, a, a, you know, 3G chip in there and, you know, easily back channel some other, uh, you know, data, data source. Good. Well, uh, let's uh, keep on topic. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I want to uh, you know give everybody a time check. We've got five minutes here uh, to to wrap up. Um, you know, any other questions uh, for for Dr. Roy? All 
All right. So thank you, Dr. Roy, for, for sharing that this has uh, been insightful. Um, look forward to uh, integrating and capturing these in, um, in our, our notes. And, uh, you know, Mark, uh, I, I, I added, uh, you know, to my uh, rolling agenda, uh, a check-in uh, from the, the NIST Big Data Working Group. Uh, you know, if there's nothing to report, uh, you know, uh, please uh, you know, just feel free to ignore. But, uh, you know, would love uh, to have you share at the beginning of our meetings uh, anything that the, the any contacts or any information that, that uh, uh, this group would, would uh, find relevant. I really appreciate the, uh, the, the perspectives that you're bringing. Sure. That uh, just uh, let me do that since you invited me and I'll make it short in, in light of our time. We, I introduced, uh, this was me dominating the last conversation we had um, in that group. We were trying to understand how to uh, do traceability for ethical requirements that are put out in organizations. And it's a big data problem because often these things are authored by um, people outside the organization, so, or inside it who, who the developers are not connected to. So to some extent, it's a traceability challenge. It's also a problem of uh, where do the natural language artifacts belong and, and what do you do with them in, in the architecture of the systems you're building. So whether it's a cloud native uh, issue, it's certainly one that we're wrestling with. And if you think about um, uh, some of the uses for algorithms that are being uh, contemplated or have already been deployed sooner or later we're all going to be in the a position of having to explain algorithms and uh, why they are recommending one thing or another to to users and so we're trying to figure out what the implications of all that are and if we can make any contributions nice yeah, it's a that's a big area uh, that uh, you know, I'm happy to uh, hear you're, you're you're trying to get out in front of uh, because uh, not a lot of folks are getting out in front of that, and that's barreling forward. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to be in the position of that poor Volkswagen engineer who ended up getting blamed for it all year. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's the um, you know. That's a that's a great perspective of, of you know how this that ends up playing out and uh, you know the individuals that 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 get the real hit uh, for for you know bigger decisions like that. Um, so you know coming up, I've got uh, Jerry uh, who uh, unfortunately couldn't uh, join us today. She had uh, a sick kid to to take care of. Um, is going to be joining us uh, for a, an overview uh, of. Uh, you know some of the the security infrastructure that uh, you know, she's been working on at CyberArk uh, that uh, you know, uh, overlaps the um, the Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry uh, deployments of uh, cloud native infrastructure. Uh, so looking forward to that. Uh, I think uh, next week we'll have uh, ADP uh, lined up. And then June 1st, uh, I am canceling the meeting. I'm going to be on the road uh, and um, in Berlin. Uh, so uh, you know, in a couple of weeks, we'll give you a, a Friday off to uh, uh, enjoy Friday things. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, see you next week. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.